Welcome to the IDEX Continuing Education Series. Well, hello and welcome to another uh, presentation in the IDEX Continuing Education Series. Uh, today we're going to talk about faecal testing and, and with an emphasis on infectious disease testing with that, both parasitology and PCR. So we're going to have a talk about well, why do you perform faecal examinations, especially when we're talking about parasitology. Um, have a look at the methods that are available for it because there's a lot of variation and they're not all the same and the accuracy of them is not the same. So it's important that we have an understanding of what are the pros and cons of different techniques. We'll also address what's new in the world of faecal parasitology testing and then really discuss how that fits in with um, PCR testing. Because often when we're thinking of uh, it, testing um, feces for infectious disease. You know, we're thinking fecal cultures, um, PCR and things like that, or maybe antigen testing like, a, you know, a parvo snap test or something like that. But, you know, we've got other things with parasitology that we can do now. So what are some of the indications for doing fecal testing? And we're talking about parasitology here. And I guess for me, we're probably going to divide it into two groups. There's looking at patients that are unwell. So, you know, a patient with acute or chronic diarrhea, depending on the setting, um, you know, we may well be doing PCR, but certainly should be looking at parasitology as well in every case. Sometimes we'll consider doing parasitology in patients that have unexplained weight loss, um, especially younger animals, but it doesn't have to just be young ones. You know, uh, you know, parasitology is very important there. In some patients with anemia, especially if it's a regenerative anemia, more consistent with blood loss, um, fecal parasitology is important to do because there are times that we can have uh, things like cookworms or whipworms that may be causing anemia um, that's very easily managed um, and if, if we diagnose that. We sometimes also use fecal parasitology in healthy patients. So looking for, um, you know, doing routine checking to see if there are fecal parasites present, you know, and sometimes patients can have occult infections. So they may have an infection without clinical signs. And so doing, you know, good quality parasitology in that setting, it's helpful to determine if we need to treat them or not. And then there's the consideration these days of whether, you know, should we be testing before we treat? So, you know, doing parasitology, if they're negative, they don't necessarily be need to be treated for intestinal parasites, but if they have a positive result, then we would treat them for that. I guess these are, these are extremes, but, you know, there are potential consequences, you know, if we miss parasitic infections. You know, things like hookworms, we can get migration with that. Um, you know, uh, parasites in, in younger animals especially may cause ill thrift and poor weight gain um, in, with significant burdens in older animals may cause weight loss. We talked before about potential anemia and things like that. And I guess the other thing that we've really got to um, consider is that there is the zoonotic aspect with it as well. You know, uh, visceral larval migrants with things like roundworms. Um, we can also get, um, you know, parasite migration with hookworms. No one wants to wake up and see that foot um, in the middle picture there. Uh, so, you know, and hookworms can burrow up through the skin. So it's, it, it has some public health consequence with that as well. So I guess, you know, the question that we've sort of got to ask ourselves is, well, what fecal testing processes do we do today? Um, you know, in, in some clinics, they're not doing a lot because they're routinely treating, but other clinics will do will do more testing. Um, you know, what do you talk to your pet owners about with intestinal parasites? You know, to educate them, and you know, what sort of resources are you using for for educating your clients? So let's have a run through some of the methods we've got for doing fecal examination. 
at the simplest end of the scale, we've got things like fecal smears. So, you know, mixing a really fresh fecal sample, um, it needs to be still warm and steaming, um, with a bit of saline on a slide and having a look at that. Probably the best um, thing, you know, the, the, it's most it's most um, useful for looking for giardia, and we're looking for the motile trophozoites with that. So if you see them moving around, you know, we know that we've got giardia there. It's less useful for our more common intestinal worms, so hookworms, roundworms, whipworms. This is not the way to try and detect those. Um, but even for Giardia, important to realise that the sensitivity is less than 50%. So it's not saying it's not worth doing. You know, it's a simple test. It's inexpensive to do. And if you're concerned about Giardia, it definitely has value. Um, and if we get a positive, it tells us, you know, that that's what they've got. But a negative does not rule out the possibility of Giardia. Then I guess we look at things like a simple fecal flotation. So using the sugar or salt solutions for that, that you're doing in house. So uh, I guess we're often looking at, you know, things like the fecalizer. So, you know, there's ones in house where you sort of have the little device, you put some feces in it, you put the sort of towel around it, you know, put some of the solution in, mix it up, put the little filter in, fill it up to the top, with the, with the solution, put the cover slip on top, leave it 15, 15 or 20 minutes, then get the um, cover slip off, put it on a slide and take a look at that. I don't think it's a technique that most people enjoy. It's a little smelly, it's a little messy. Um, the other thing to remember is that these solutions um, are pretty hard on your microscope as well. So you've got to make sure you clean the objectives with that, otherwise it's going to damage, um, damage the microscope with it. And we've got to get the right concentration of solution. If the density is too low, they sink, we need to, to be able to get the eggs to float, but not uh, a density that's going to sort of damage the eggs with that. So it's, you know, the solution has to be mixed well. Um, the accuracy is going to depend on the expertise of the person doing the test. So I know my experience in clinics has been I don't particularly like doing fecal floats, so I will give that to one of the nurses. Um, they might give it to the next junior nurse, and it ends up with often the most junior person in the practice because they can't say no. They don't have anyone else to pass it on to. So sometimes we have a technique that has um, limited capability for, for picking up parasites being done by the least experienced person in the practice. Um, so that can reduce its accuracy a little more. So let me say, doing a simple fecal flotation in the clinic is certainly better than not doing any testing at all. So not trying to, to discourage that, but we've got techniques that can give us more. And the other challenge with this technique is, you know, we know for the parasites that they're not, you know, if they're in their pre-patent period, um, we won't see larvae, or even in a period where they could be shedding eggs, you know, not all of them are consistently shedding eggs. So we can get false negative results as a result of that. And that's not because someone hasn't done the test well, it's just the limitation of the technique. So we can then look at, so that's a sort of passive flotation that we talk about, you know, that you're doing um, in clinic. You can have what we call an active flotation, which is uh, a flotation centrifugation technique. And that's what we do in our laboratories. So it's using a different concentration of solution and a different technique to try and um, we're using zinc sulfate for that. It's trying to increase the sensitivity of the technique, you know, to give us better results with that. So, you know, the, the advantage of the in-house kits are they're very inexpensive, but, you know, we get a better sensitivity by doing the technique in the laboratory. And there's a group in the States called the Companion Animal Parasite Council. Um, this is a group of um, veterinarians, parasitologists, um, human doctors, zoonotic disease people, 
um, medico legal people, you know, zoonotic experts to get together and create recommendations for diagnosis and management of different parasites. And certainly the CAPC suggests that for flotation techniques, we're better off doing the flotation centrifugation technique with that. So this, this is looking at some data from a study. It was done a few years ago now, back in 2006. Um, uh, it was published in um, the Compendium. Um, and it was comparing on the same, you know, on the same faecal samples, the difference in um, isolation of the number of eggs recovered from a simple flotation technique at different times with the flotation. So five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 and 20 minutes and comparing that to the flotation centrifugation technique. And you can see with this that there was significantly higher numbers of eggs identified using um, the flotation centrifugation technique with that. So we know that we're using a better technique in that setting. This is looking at some data um, a, a different way with that. And so it's looking at the rate of um, false negative results. So where we've missed infections with that. And you can see for hookworms, you know, um, nearly 5% false negatives on the simple flotation, drop that to 1% with the flotation centrifugation. Your roundworms drop from 26 to 10. Um, whipworms improve significantly. Um, and even some tapeworms like Tenia, um, it improved the sensitivity there too. So, even though it means you've got to send the sample to the lab, it has some advantages. No one likes doing the faecal floats in clinic. You know, they're smelly, they're messy, they can mess with the, your microscope. Um, so we can send it to the laboratory to get a technique done by trained scientists and also a technique that has you know, higher sensitivity with it. So we're going to pick up more infections with that. So there's really nothing to lose by doing that. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, based on the Companion Parasite Council recommendations and these studies, you know, we can show that the centrifugation method really maximizes the number of eggs that we can recover um, with fecal parasitology. But now um, we've got ways that we can try and give you more information with that. So, you know, beyond that zinc sulfate centrifugation with, you know, a trained scientist having a look at that, um, there are now um, antigen techniques. So rather than looking for larvae in the feces, we are looking for antigen coming from the adult parasite to detect in the feces and to try and improve both the sensitivity and the specificity with that. And it's an antigen test that's an ELISA test. So, you know, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So it's, it's a good quality technique for that. So it has a number of advantages. So first of all, even with a single sex infection, you can get positives. We're also going to pick up things significantly sooner because once there are adults there, even if it's in the prepatent period when they're not producing larvae, um, we're going to be able to detect the infection. Um, and also for some of the agents that have intermittent shedding of larvae, this is a much better technique, you know, to try and make that diagnosis. So the Companion Oil Parasite Council have given some recommendations on these. Um, they say that, you know, if we start with hookworms, that if you're doing, um, you know, the more routine parasitology, we're better off doing um, the flotation with centrifugation. But they also suggest that, you know, really the commercial ELISA assays um, are, you know, are going to give us an extra layer of information with that because they're not linked to egg production. They looked at it for roundworms as well. Again, suggested the flotation centrifugation technique if you're doing routine parasitology. But again, um, antigen tests will increase the sensitivity of testing. And surprise, surprise, um, they say the same for hookworms. So, you know, do the flotation centrifugation, but also um, the, the antigen test um, gives us a lot more um, information. 
And the other thing, you know, as I say, if we are doing the, the flotation centrifugation, you know, having um, trained scientists do it is, has value as well. I know over the years when I've had patients with diarrhea and you're looking at that fecal float and you're like, oh, you're trying to convince yourself that there's something there. Um, and other things like, you know, pollens or grain mite over, you know, can, can look like some parasites. Even in some cases, you know, parasites may just be passing through. So, for example, you know, a dog that's gotten into a cat's litter tray, um, it may have feline roundworm eggs passing through its gut, um, but they're just a passenger, you know, on the way through. They're not actually causing causing an infection. So, you know, it, it really is a win-win situation. By sending the fecal samples to the lab, you are getting that nasty sample out of the clinic. Your staff will be happy with you for that. Um, and we're getting better quality results for your pet owners. So everybody wins with that. So looking at what we're doing in the lab now, this is looking at the outcomes of the faecal antigen testing. So we can see with that, with hookworms, you know, we're significantly increasing um, uh, the sensitivity of the test. So more than doubling sensitivity by combining um, the faecal antigen testing with the ovarian parasite testing over doing the ovarian parasite testing alone. Roundworms, we're increasing it probably by at least 50%. Um, with that, roundworms tend to be more prolific egg shedders, so you know the the ovarian parasite testing um, will will um, sometimes give us the the result with that. Um, but you know we can still improve it further with with the antigen testing, and you can see with whipworms it makes a really significant difference with that, because one of the challenges with whipworms is this they can be so intermittent with their shedding of eggs that it really um, makes a big difference by detecting um, the adult worms. Um, this uh, is out of a published paper looking at sort of um, the ovarian parasite testing versus the antigen testing, showing the difference in time for when tests can be uh, shot positive um, uh, in, in infected animals. And this is looking um, at whipworms. So in this study, you know, the first time you could detect um, larvae in the feces was at day 69 after infection, um, whereas the antigen test was showing up positive at day 31, so significantly sooner. And we know that whipworms can cause, you know, uh, GI disease, they can cause anemia and things like that. <clears throat> so excuse me, so by being able to detect to detect those nearly 40 days earlier, um, where we're doing better by the patient with that. And by treating them sooner, we're going to minimize the risk of getting significant disease as a result of that. And whipworms can certainly do it. You know, uh, I know in the past I've seen patients with significant regenerative anemias. Um, you know, with, with whipworm infections, um, they can cause large intestinal disease. And it's nice, you know, I must admit, my, my routine in the past is, you know, before I would do a colonoscopy on a patient, even if they'd had fecal flotations, I would often treat them with fembendazole um, before doing a colonoscopy because nobody wants to diagnose whipworms on colonoscopy. Um, uh, but with the antigen test, we can be a lot more precise um, about knowing whether they've got a whipworm infection or not. Now, just looking briefly at the diarrhea PCRs here, not in any way going to go through this in, in any significant depth, but you know, having a look at the diarrhea PCRs, what are their indications? You know, and I am not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that we need to be doing a diarrhea PCR on every patient you see with diarrhea. You know, sometimes you'll get a patient with acute diarrhea, they're still clinically well. Um, you know, the chances are they probably just ate something silly um, and it's upset their gut. Um, and, you know, with symptomatic therapy, they're going to improve over a few days. Always good to do parasitology, but we maybe don't necessarily need to go as far as a, um, a PCR for that. If they've got a severe acute diarrhea, 
You've got a whole litter of puppies with acute diarrhea and they're getting unwell with that. Um, the diarrhea is significantly hemorrhagic, things like that. Then adding um, the, the diarrhea PCR in, in that setting can be useful. It certainly has a place with chronic diarrhea as well. You know, in, in those patients where we're really, once it's getting chronic, we really need to work them up to find out what's causing the problem. So doing parasitology, looking for infectious causes with that, you know, doing diet trials with them, um, you know, potentially looking at, you know, ultrasounds and endoscopies, doing a minimum database, a CBS and a chemistry to make sure we don't have a metabolic cause for the diarrhea, you know, things like, um, you know, hypoadrenocorticism or pancreatitis or things like that. Um, but, you know, in those cases, if, if we're working down, uh, down the list of causes, we can try and rule in or out some of the infections um, with that by doing a PCR. So when we look at um, uh, dogs with what we include in the PCR panels, uh, we look for some bacterial pathogens, so Campylobacters. One thing with Campylobacter on PCR compared to cultures is there are a number of Campylobacter species that are isolated at the same rate from dogs or cats with diarrhea as without diarrhea, so they may not necessarily be pathogenic. Um, the Campylobacter coli and Campylobacter jejuni are ones that are isolated at a higher rate from patients with diarrhea than normal patients. So that's why we were including those ones um, in, in the PCR panel. So we're trying to look for the more relevant ones. Um, you know, salmonella we look for there. There are particular viral agents we're looking for. So, you know, distemper, circovirus, circovirus is, you know, if that's causing a problem, it's often hemorrhagic diarrhea, um, parvo. Coronavirus, I'm thinking more young animals with that. If it's an adult animal with that, it's likely not the cause of the diarrhea. Um, we looked for some um, protozoal things with cryptosporidium and giardia. And then we're looking for some of the um, toxin genes with clostridium perfringens. They're ones that they're quantified. Um, so we look for the androtoxin, the alpha toxin, and the net EF toxins. And the net EF toxin has been more commonly found in patients with hemorrhagic diarrhea. So if you have a sort of um, low range result on the quant result, it's likely not significant. Um, if it's high range, it's possible. And I must admit, I always think with clostridia, you know, if I get a high range result, it could be the sole cause of the diarrhea. It may still be incidental. Probably what's more likely happening is it's a reflector of underlying gut disease. Um, and that's why the clostridial numbers have increased with that. If we look at what we do um, with, with cats, uh, we're looking for the same bacterial species, uh, looking for coronavirus and panleukopenia with the viral things. Uh, a few more protozoa. So we're looking for the cryptosporidium and giardia as we do in dogs, but also toxoplasma and trichomonas, you know, which is going to be seen in sort of fairly specific circumstances. Um, we're not looking for the net EF clostridial toxin, just the alpha toxin and the enterotoxin um, with that. I guess PCR always requires interpretation. So it needs to be interpreted in light of the patient. So as I said before, if you know, you know, if it's a four or five year old cat or four or five year old dog, um, I, I and I get a positive coronavirus, I don't get too worried about that. You know, I'm more concerned that that could be a cause of, a, of diarrhea in a young patient. Um, so you just need to look at the patient and say, does this does this result, is it likely going to be causing the signs we're seeing? You know, as say a low range clostridia, I'm not going to, to get too concerned about. So the quantification of determining how much of that gene is there, um, it, it really looks at how many cycles of the PCR it takes to be positive. If it only takes a few cycles, it was more of the, the nucleic acid there to begin with, um, whereas if it takes more cycles, there was less of it to begin with. Um, also important to see that we see quite a lot of co-infections, um, you know, reasonably high rates of that. So there's more than one pathogen there. Sometimes I will determine, you know, for example, if I got Campylobacter and Cryptosporidium together, I'm probably going to treat the Campylobacter first and see how we go with that. If not, 
if it doesn't resolve them, I might need to treat the cryptosporidium. Um, you know, if I had sort of Campylobacter and the Clostridia, I'm probably going to treat the Campylobacter again and see if we get that under control, whether the Clostridia settles down. So we need to interpret those in light of the patient. And if you have any questions about that, you can obviously ring um, our internal medicine consulting service and one of the specialists would be happy to help you out with that interpretation. I think if we're going to be doing, if we've got a patient with diarrhea significant enough um, to do a PCR on, we need to be doing parasitology as well. Um, and this is a situation where I would do both the flotation centrifugation and the antigen test. So the antigen test is great to say, you know, do they have hookworm, whipworm, roundworm or not. Um, the cent flotation centrifugation gives us information as well. So if you're finding Giardia cysts in there, you know, it tells us that, you know, there's something a bit more active there. Um, you know, we might find, especially on younger animals, if we're finding um, things like, um, uh, you know, isospora or things in there. Um, you know, if we're finding coccidia, that may be, you know, which we can find on the flotation, that may be in certain patients an extra thing that we need to consider treating. So it, it's really important to consider adding the combination of those tests if you're running a diarrhea PCR. Just going back, you know, remember we talked right at the beginning about, you know, parasitology can be, um, in patients with diarrhea or weight loss or anemia or things like that, but there are times that we're doing it as part of a preventive care or wellness screen. You know, the Companion Animal Parasite Council that we discussed before suggests that in you know um, young animals, you should be doing fecal parasitology every few months. They suggest in adult animals, even if they're on a good deworming um, uh, scheme, they should uh, be being um, have fecal parasitology done once or twice a year. So it's an important part of that annual health check to to do that parasitology. Now you could sort of get the owner to bring in a sample. Um, it's not always fun for the owner having a fecal sample in the car with them when they come in. It's always amazing some of the containers they come in um, to the clinic in. Uh, you know, you can try and do a rectal exam, but it depends if the animal's really small or there's no feces there, we can't get it. So that, that gets a little more frustrating with that. So there's a solution to this. We have this fecal check home collection kit. So the way it works is that you can, um, you can buy these boxes. They come in packs of 10. Um, and so you have those in the clinic and you sell this kit to the client. What it's got in it is um, a little uh, container with a scoop on it so they can collect a fecal sample at home, put it in the jar, they seal that inside the box and what you also need to provide them is, is a request form um, for you know, asking for the fecal antigen as part of a sort of home collection kit with that. So they put the fecal sample and the form in the box and as alarming as this sounds, it's a bit like those, um, you know, uh, kits you get when you're over 50 to look for blood in, in feces, um, the people go and put this kit in the, in the post box, just an Australia post box, and that goes to our Brisbane laboratory. Then they run that fecal check or the fecal antigen panel with that. Uh, and what happens then is they've got the request form, they know which clinic it is, those results will come to you um, via Vet Connect Plus. So owner collects a sample at home, posts it off, you get the results um, to determine is this a patient, does it have parasites or not, um, you know, does it require treatment or not with that. You can either email them the results through Vet Connect Plus or you can call them for that. But it's a nice way to you know, get that fecal sample without having to deal with that fecal sample in the clinic um, and send that off yourself with that. We've got, uh, we've got some advantage programs um, to, to help you cost-wise if you're doing some of these extra tests. So we have the IDEX Advantage Fecal um, Antigen Panel. So this is a discounted code that if you're adding this to say a diarrhea PCR panel, you get a significantly discounted um, fecal antigen panel with that, you know, so that you can combine it with the, um, the PCR test. 
We also have the IDEX advantage fecal flotation. So this is the flotation centrifugation technique that we can do that um, in the lab. And you can combine that with the um, antigen panel if you want. You know, for, for patients that you're doing preventive screening, the antigen profile on its own is fine. But if they've got diarrhea, just looking for a few of those extra things, it's nice to combine it with the um, uh, flotation centrifugation technique. Um, the fecal antigen profile is discounted when it's part of that home collection kit. And we also run Giardia as a routine part of that. Um, if it's this sort of um, routine collection kit, there was a parasite survey that was published about 12 or 13 years ago in Australia, done by a group in Western Australia and Queensland, I believe. They looked at, um, they got fecal samples from all over the country, um, from healthy pets or from owned pets, from animals in shelters, did a big survey with it. And one of the most common parasites in dogs was Giardia. So that's what, you know, it's not going to be managed by the routine um, deworming medication. Um, so, the, um, uh, the home collection kit um, includes the Giardia with that. So those, those um, profiles are available. So just in review, um, you know, fecal parasitology, I think is really indicated any time we have a patient with diarrhea, weight loss, ill thrift, anemia, things like that. You know, it, it's really important to know We've got a number of different methodologies with it. Um, the methodologies vary with their simplicity, their cost and things like that, but the results you get from them also vary. So, you know, uh, a fecal smear or a wet mount, um, useful for some Giardia patients, um, not perfect sensitivity, but if you find it, that's great. Not finding it doesn't rule it out. You know, a fecal float in clinic is better than doing no parasitology at all for sure. But we've got better techniques we can do in the lab with the flotation centrifugation. We've also got the antigen profile, which takes it to the next level now. Um, we've got the PCR. So we talked about the indications with certain acute diarrheas, or chronic diarrheas, um, but really also important to add the parasitology with that. And we now have the fecal check, which for your preventive care and wellness screening is a really nice way to be able to check um, your patients for parasites with that take home kit. So I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can get me through IDEX um, or, or you know, ring the call centre. Uh, uh, but you know, I think definitely would encourage you to do more fecal parasitology and look at doing the PCR in the patients where um, it's indicated. So thanks for your time and please reach out if you've got any questions. <laughs>